Hey everyone, hope your Wednesday is going well and I hope your week's going well. Uh, so, we've got a big day for you. Big day, huge day, huge. Monumental. So, uh, I thought we'd start class with uh, like we used to do with a couple of jokes. So, here they are. Uh, first one What do you call 10 rabbits hopping backward through the snow together? A receding hairline. Boom! <laughs> okay, so number two. Why did the boy keep his trumpet out in the snow? I think Mr. Eifert would like this one. Because he liked cool music. Huh? Boom! That's what you get. That is what you get. Okay, and three. What did the snowman have for breakfast? I think you're going to get this one. Frosted snowflakes. Boom! Yeah. Yeah. Hope you liked them. Anyway. Alright, let's get started with class. Let's see what we have going on today. So today in class, you're going to check in the homework, which was 14.1 Graph Organizer. Uh, watch a clip about Andrew Jackson, kind of the beginning years and uh, prior to the inauguration. Uh, and then I'm going to give you a quick PowerPoint, just kind of reviewing uh, all the stuff that you've already learned, but in, you know, bulleted list fashion. So let's go ahead and get started with the homework from last night. So while the sub is going around and checking in your work, um, I want you to review in your groups what you had for each of these things, uh, each of these. So while the sub is coming around and checking in your homework, I want you to review in your groups uh, each of the rows and what you put in each one of them. So uh, why did they put the cabin, what does that represent about his life, uh, why Jackson on the horse, why the campaign poster, and then finally, what did you put in the uh, last box here? Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes to go over that and see you in a few. All right, well, I hope that went well for you. Uh, if there were any questions that you and your group couldn't answer, then uh, feel free to raise your hand and uh, you guys can discuss it as a group. If not, Let's go ahead and get started with the Jackson video. So this is a clip from a PBS series um, that talks about Andrew Jackson, his life, and his presidency. So uh, enjoy. Ha! They called him Old Hickory, America's first working class president. A hero to the common man a barbarian to the upper class, a cold-hearted demon to Indians, a steely-eyed fighter who made every battle personal, on dueling grounds, battlefields, and in the White House, a shrewd politician who branded his own form of democracy, who despised paper money, yet ended up on the $20 bill, Andrew Jackson. On January 8, 1815, Major General Andrew Jackson faced the challenge of a lifetime. In the climactic battle of the War of 1812, 10,000 British redcoats invaded the South at New Orleans. One obstacle stood in the way of the British regaining their former colonies, Jackson and his ragged army of 4,000 militia, pirates, Indians, Creoles, and slaves. The British expected an easy victory, but they knew little of the man they were facing, whose determination to win was fueled by a deep personal hatred that went back more than 30 years. In 1781, when Jackson was 14 and the Revolutionary War was raging, British soldiers stormed a cabin where he and his brother Robert tried to hide. The boys were taken prisoner serving as couriers in the Continental Army. Three words from a British officer would light a fuse in Jackson 
that burn for a lifetime. Clean my boots. Jackson, with that insolence that would characterize him for his entire life, refused. He said, I'm a prisoner of war, and I demand to be treated accordingly. Jackson was, had always been a sassy kid, and now he was miffed at having been taken prisoner. And the officer pulls his sword and, and takes a swipe at Jackson's head. And Jackson throws up his arm and caught the sword on the side of his hand, but it didn't quite prevent the sword from hitting him in the head. And blood runs down for the rest of his life. He had this scar on his hand and a crease in his skull. Andrew and his brother were taken to a squalid British prison camp where they both contracted smallpox. They probably would have died there if not for their widowed mother, Elizabeth. She essentially made her case to the British officers in charge of the camp. These are only boys. Uh, you got to let them out. Uh, a mother's love, a mother's anger, ultimately sufficed to, to spring Jackson and his brother. When she received her two sons that were both desperately ill, she had only one horse. So she put the older boy, who was far worse, on the horse. And they walked about 40 miles. Jackson had to walk that distance uh, behind them, still suffering from smallpox. And by the time they got home, the older boy was dead. And Jackson was delirious. For six months, Elizabeth struggled to keep Andrew alive at their cabin in the Carolinas' Waxhaw region. Her husband was killed in a logging accident. Her oldest son died fighting for the Continental Army. They were typical of frontier families. The Westerners, the frontiersmen, they weren't people who were born to privilege or born to property. They were out on the frontier because they hadn't been doing so well where they came from. And they got used to the idea that whatever they were gonna get in life, they were gonna have to take. Andrew survived the smallpox, but six months later, his mother died of cholera leaving Andrew a bitter, tough young orphan. He's taken up by one of the relatives, and he lives in the house, and there was some visitor who threatened him at one time, as I recall, and raised his hand to strike him. And the kid says to him, if you touch me, if you strike me, you're a dead man. As a young boy, he was, he, he was a, a real hellion. I mean, he fought, he cursed, he drank, he smoked tobacco. Uh, he did everything he wasn't supposed to do, and his mama wanted him to be a Presbyterian preacher. Uh, that didn't work out. As a teenager, Jackson had no interest in any particular vocation or education. Money was earned by gambling on horse races and dice games. But as he matured, Jackson realized his life had to change. He wanted to better himself. He wanted more out of life. He decided that staying in the Waxhaws after the war was offered nothing. So he decided to do what, at times, it seemed half the population of the frontier did. He decided to become a lawyer. It was a natural for Jackson. He was an argumentative sort, and lawyers argue for a living. But he eventually found his way to Salisbury, North Carolina, where he studied the law under the highly esteemed attorney, Spruce McKay. Spruce McKay had already taught the law to William Richardson Davy, a hero, Jackson's hero in the Revolutionary War. So you found a lawyer who was well established and who had a law library, and you'd read. And if you had any kind of ambition, You'd gradually learn what lawyers did. You'd draw up wills, you'd draw up contracts, you'd learn the process. And if the clients wanted to risk their lawsuits on this young guy with very little experience, then it was their risk. And after a while, they discovered that uh, Jackson was reasonably good at this. Jackson, although poorly educated, had a great yes. command of the language. And if you read his letters, you know, they're not well constructed always. And he would misspell a word, uh, misspell it in, in four or five different ways on the same page. Spelling meant nothing. It was the conviction. It was the passion. It was the temper. 
that he wished to communicate. For the first time in his life, 20-year-old Jackson had gained some respect. He began to shed the skin of his lower class upbringing, but the suit of a gentleman proved an awkward fit. Turn the circle halfway round. After three years in Salisbury, North Carolina, Jackson had gained acceptance into town society. He wore the right clothes, said the right things. He even learned to dance. He had a kind of charisma. It was a kind of personality that, that drew people to him because they thought, if you stick with this guy, you can accomplish great things. Jackson had high expectations for himself. And he let people know that he was somebody who was going somewhere. And that once he set his mind to something, he was almost certain to accomplish it. Jackson attended the local dancing school so frequently, he was asked to manage Salisbury's annual Christmas ball. He invited all of the proper young ladies and gentlemen to come. And as a joke, he invited the town's notorious prostitutes, thinking they would never come, understanding that it was a dance for the gentry. And they showed up in all their finery to the astonishment, if not the anger and outrage, of the more genteel individuals at the dance, and they were really angry. Jackson could do outrageous things from time to time. <laughs> Jackson's boisterous personality began to reveal itself in other ways as well. He fell in with a crowd of young guys about his own age who decided the most exciting thing they could do was carouse at every opportunity. In one case, uh, they got drunk and they uh, somehow or other decided that they were going to build a fire and the fire eventually got bigger and they were going to throw more things in the fire and they ultimately almost burned down the tavern where they were. Later on, uh, after Jackson became famous, there were a whole lot of people who said, Jackson? Andrew Jackson? That guy we knew back then? It utterly boggled their minds to think that anything good had come from that young guy. In 1788, Jackson headed west to Tennessee, not yet a state, but a territory. He settled in Nashville, where, within a year, a superior court judge made 21-year-old Jackson a prosecutor, a prestigious appointment that did not go over well with many of his more experienced peers, including a lawyer named Waitstill Avery. He probably said, you don't really know the law, and I would suspect that might be true. Jackson took offense. So he challenged him to a duel. When Jackson was a very young boy, just prior to his mother's passing away, one of the things she told him was, don't tell lies and don't accept slanders, but settle those problems yourself. By which she meant, don't sue for slander. Call them out on the dueling field. Jackson was somebody who often acted as though he had something to prove. And he did. I mean, what he had to prove was that he was worthy of people's respect, that folks ought to pay attention to him. And dueling, especially on that part of the frontier, was a way somebody earned respect. It was the first duel of Jackson's life. He was not a good shot, and he knew it. But since he had made the challenge, he had to go through with it. To save his own honor, Avery could not back down. Both aimed and fired, straight up into the air. Without anyone's knowledge, the men had privately agreed beforehand to avoid direct shots. It was a first sign that Jackson could control his temper. The young Hellion was beginning to mature. Whether or not it ultimately led to the exchange of gunfire, the real duel itself, it let people know that Jackson, Andrew Jackson, this young guy, wasn't somebody to be trifled with. Again, troops under Jackson's command emerged victorious. When Spain officially gave up Florida, Jackson resigned from the army, accepting an appointment as governor to organize the new territorial government. Rachel joined him in Pensacola. There's perception of her that she was perhaps demure and didn't want to involve herself in political affairs. But what we see in Pensacola 
is her taking a very active role in advising Jackson on how he feels he should govern that city. Jackson needed only 11 weeks to set up Florida's new government. Shortly after returning home, he suffered a physical breakdown. At age 55, the years of fighting duels, Indians, and the British had taken their toll. For several months, violent coughing spells and severe dysentery made life miserable. Though retirement seemed inevitable, Jackson became obsessed about rampant corruption in Washington, and his sense of moral outrage pushed him to consider running for president. What really got Jackson's attention, what really convinced him that he had to put his hat in the ring was when people said, you are a soldier, you have said that you support the interests of the American people. Well, if you're serious about this and if the American people call you to office, you have no choice but to answer the call. So Jackson allowed his name to be put into nomination for the presidency in 1824. 1824 was a watershed election in the United States. For the first time, a substantial number of commoners could vote for president. The Constitution simply says, that the states shall choose electors. It didn't say how the state shall choose electors. And in most states, until the 1820s, the electors were chosen by the state legislatures. But during 1810s and 1820s, increasingly, ordinary voters get to cast their ballots for president, technically for the electors, but in effect, for president. Jackson, the hero of New Orleans, appealed to voters across the nation and easily won the popular vote with a count of 153,000. John Quincy Adams, whose support came primarily from the Northeast, received 108,000 votes. Treasury Secretary William Crawford and House Speaker Henry Clay narrowly split another 90,000 votes. Jackson also received the most electoral votes, 99. But he needed a true majority, 131, to become president. As provided by the Constitution, Members of the House of Representatives had to choose among the three front runners, Jackson, Adams, and Crawford. The fourth place finisher, Henry Clay, having received 37 electoral votes, was in a powerful position to sway the election. Clay was the hero of the West. He's from Kentucky, until Jackson comes along. Jackson's from Tennessee. And Jackson is the greater hero, being the military hero. So Clay swings his support to John Quincy Adams, who carries the day, wins the presidency, becomes president, and turns around and names Henry Clay to be Secretary of State. Now, in our day and age, this might not seem like a big deal, but in those days, it was everything because a succession of presidents before John Quincy Adams had gone from Secretary of State to president. So in naming Henry Clay to be Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams essentially made him heir apparent to the presidency. Jackson was furious. He publicly damned Clay for what he called a corrupt bargain. He called him Judas of the West. Judas has received his 30 pieces of silver, and he will have the same ending. Jackson and his supporters, they declared that the election had been stolen, the will of the people had been frustrated. And immediately, in the spring of 1825, they began the campaign of 1828. We often think today that elections last a long time. Not at all. They don't have anything on the campaigns of the 1820s. While Jackson remained in Tennessee over the next three years, his surrogates worked tirelessly throughout the country to secure the Democratic Party nomination. Although not officially defined as such, the election of 1828 produced the first choice between a Republican John Quincy Adams, supported by established power brokers, and Jackson, the Democrat, who championed the cause of the common man. The election campaign of 1820 was probably the dirtiest campaign in American political history. Everything that Jackson had done wrong, or that anybody thought had done wrong, was dragged out and used against him. They said some terrible things about his mother, Jackson's mother. They said she was a prostitute who was brought to this country to serve as British soldiers. And of uh, Rachel Jackson, that she was a bigamist. And by implication, if not otherwise, 
a whore. Rachel never states that she's aware that she's become a liability for her husband. I think she was always confident in his love for her, even if perhaps she may have sensed that some of those around him might have seen her as baggage. The three years of organized campaigning by Jackson's supporters paid off. In November 1828, Jackson won both the popular vote and the electoral majority, becoming the seventh president of the United States. But his joy was short-lived, as Rachel had a heart attack one month later. General Jackson! General Jackson! What is it? On December 22nd, Rachel Donaldson Robards Jackson died. At the moment of his greatest political victory, he suffers the most severe personal blow he could imagine. Rachel had been his lifelong companion, had been the love of his life, and now she's taken from him. On the day that they had originally scheduled to go to Washington, Rachel was buried instead, and Jackson chose to bury her in the garden at the Hermitage, which she had loved so much. Jackson was absolutely convinced that she was murdered by those people who had said these things about her. And on her tombstone, he had written that here lies you know, a, a sainted being who was viciously attacked, but whose virtue could surpass it all. The death of his beloved wife sent President-elect Andrew Jackson plunging from triumph to despair. He couldn't imagine leaving the Hermitage and moving into the White House without Rachel as his first lady. He almost decided not to go to Washington. He believed that his emotional life, in a certain sense, was over. And for months after, he was in a very deep depression. He, he wrote, the one thing that made him decide that he had to go was, first of all, the people had chosen him. And Jackson had an absolute reverence for the will of the people. But there was also something personal, and that was, my enemies have killed Rachel. They will pay. So off he goes to be inaugurated president. More on Andrew Jackson's inauguration later, like tonight for homework. All right, so a lot of that information uh, was covered in your textbook, or you might remember some of it from the uh, short video you watched yesterday, the uh, Disney version of Andrew Jackson. Um, but I wanted to take some time and kind of go over um, the high points of uh, Jackson's presidency so that you guys have it actually in, in written or PowerPoint form uh, like you're used to for this class. So um, if you want, uh, the PowerPoint is on Schoology that we're about to go over. It's called 14.1 PPTX. It should be in the update as well as... Um, the materials section of Schoology. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so here we go. Uh, you've seen these pictures before in the uh, homework from last night and what you covered today. Uh, Andrew Jackson, the self-made man. So what they're talking about here, what self-made means uh, is basically a person who didn't come from wealth, someone who uh, was not born into privilege uh, but kind of earned everything him or herself. Um, some of you might know the story of um, Alexander Hamilton. He's one of those types of people who didn't have a lot of wealth. Uh, the opposite of that would be maybe maybe Miley Cyrus, because her dad, Billy Ray Cyrus, was already a star in the music industry. So Andrew Jackson uh, had a pretty rough life. He actually had three brothers. Um, one of them died before Jackson was born. The other died, uh, as it said in the video, during the Revolutionary War. Uh, Andrew Jackson's father died before he Andrew Jackson was born. Uh, they say it was a heart attack, but nobody really knows. Anyway, uh, he lived a really rough life, Andrew Jackson did, and I think that really kind of um, changed the way he viewed things. Um, Andrew Jackson was a, the type of guy who, who really loved school more than sports and I think that uh, I think that, that a lot of you can maybe relate to that maybe not sports but you know what other whatever other activity it is that uh, that you enjoy 
So Andrew Jackson had a number of jobs prior to becoming president. He um, was a lawyer. He uh, made saddles. He uh, even tried his hand as a uh, teacher for a while, but he was not very well-tempered and it didn't go well. So like I said, Andrew Jackson had a pretty tough life growing up. Uh, he had already lost three brothers, um, and Andrew Jackson uh, fell ill, as it said in the video, on the way back from the POW camp. His mom nursed him back to health, but then as soon as she nursed him back to health, uh, she went ahead and left, and left Andrew Jackson with some, uh, with some relatives. But Andrew Jackson was not taken in with the relatives like a part of the family. He was actually taken in as kind of a, uh, a servant or something like that. Um, so Jackson had a pretty tough life. Uh, he didn't have a lot of formal schooling uh, growing up. He, he mostly just learned uh, how to read from, from being in church and, and things like that and going to church schools. Um, but for him, as luck would have it, uh, actually his grandpa died. Now, I know that's terrible news for most of us, but for Jackson, he wasn't that close to his grandpa, plus his grandpa left, us, left him some money. So he took that money, bought a couple suits, moved to North Carolina, learned how to be a lawyer. So in those days, they didn't have a formal law school necessarily. You'd go and you'd train with somebody, with a lawyer, and then when you were far enough along, you would uh, basically explain to a judge, you know, what you know about law, and you try a couple cases, and then they would approve you. After he does that, he moves to Nashville. Uh, this is where he has a whole bunch of different uh, jobs. Um, he earns enough money, his practice does well, and he buys some land and some slaves. He got in a duel actually a few times in his life and was shot in the chest but survived. This picture here is actually a picture of Andrew Jackson. Uh, a man tried to assassinate him, but as you can see down here, there were actually two pistols. Uh, as Jackson was coming out of coming out of Congress, the man came up to him, tried to fire this pistol, it didn't fire, tried to fire, tried to fire this pistol, it also didn't fire, so then Andrew Jackson attacked him with the cane, um, and, and one of his buddies, I think this guy, had to uh, pull Andrew Jackson off the guy. Um, it's really very coincidental that the two guns did not fire because the uh, police took both of the guns in uh, as evidence and then later, um, a couple of hours after they'd taken him in for evidence, tested them to see if they'd fire and they both fired perfectly. So Jackson escaped with his life there just kind of by luck. So Jackson gets into politics while serving in the Tennessee State House and Senate. However, he really makes a name for himself in the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, we talked about this battle a couple times during the War of 1812. Right at the war end of the War of 1812, uh, Jackson um, leads this monumental charge in New Orleans and kills a ton of British and like none of his men die. Anyway, he earns this name, this nickname, Old Hickory from his men. Basically, it's saying he's just a really strong leader and that he's dependable and he's really looking out for his men. Um, so that kind of describes that. Uh, this picture should look familiar from the homework. Hopefully you guys, when you talked about this, you were talking about Andrew Jackson as a commander uh, in the American Army and his how he uh, really develops a name for himself as a commander. That's really uh, how he becomes known, not just in America, but worldwide. So in 1824, Jackson runs for president against Henry Clay, uh, William Crawford, and John Quincy Adams. This was a, a very contested election, uh, primarily because uh, Jackson receives the most popular votes. However, nobody received the majority of the electoral votes, which is 131. As you guys already know from studying the Constitution unit, if there is no majority of electoral votes, the, the uh, election goes to the uh, House of Representatives. In this case, Henry Clay was the lowest vote getter, and so he was eliminated from the ballot uh, in the House of Representatives. 
Okay, so uh, as we mentioned, Henry Clay received the lowest number of electoral votes, so he was booted from the election. John Quincy Adams, John Quincy Adams, not John Adams. The Q is very important uh, because John Adams was the second president. John Quincy Adams becomes the sixth president. Sorry, it's bad wrong. Bad number six. John Quincy Adams is John Adams' son. I like to call John Quincy Adams Jaqua, J-Q-A. So, uh, John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay agree on most issues. So, Adams asked Henry Clay for support. And Henry Clay says, of course I'll support you. You know, we agree on a lot of things. Well, Adams then makes Clay his Secretary of State. The Secretary of State position was a really powerful position at the time because a lot of the previous presidents had been Secretaries of State. Uh, so Andrew Jackson and his supporters felt like Clay had prevented a fair election. So they feel like Adams and Clay had this, this corrupt bargain. That's where this comes from. So uh, a bargain is like a deal, and corrupt means basically bad or unfair, something of that nature. Remember that Jackson is this champion uh, for democracy, or he's seen as champion of democracy, a champion of the common man. And Jackson and his supporters really felt like um, the, the corrupt bargain from Clay and Adams just was continuing the uh, insider politics and all the things that were wrong um, with America at the time. So again, as we talked about with Monroe, Monroe was president during the era of good feelings. And one of the high points of uh, the time then was that there was only one political party. That political party was the Democratic Republicans. Jackson and his supporters, however, felt that the Democratic Republicans had lost their way because of this corrupt bargain. The supporters and Jackson formed this new political party. They just dropped the Republican part, and they have they come up with this name, the Democratic Party. This is the Democratic Party that we know today, the Barack Obama Democratic Party or whatever. Jackson and his supporters, the friends of Jackson, are really upset about this, the outcome of this election, and they promise revenge in the 1828 election. Now, a lot of the times we tend to think of the election cycle lasting forever in today's world, and really it's because it does, uh, but Jackson and his supporters started campaigning all the way in 1824, um, and so they campaigned for four whole years prior to uh, the election, the actual election of Jackson. Uh, if this image, which is kind of grainy, um, seems familiar, that's good. It's because it should. So this is just a poster inspiring people to vote for Jackson and, and really getting people to, to, to come out and support him. It really is doing a nice job illustrating the creation of this new party, this Democratic Party. So the election of 1828. Uh, Adams and Jackson were both nominated by nominating convention. So a nominee, sorry about that. So a nominating convention and not a caucus. So a caucus is what they had been doing. Uh, the political parties had been doing in years prior. Uh, it's basically where um, groups of high level political officials come together and they figure out who's going to run for the particular party in the next election. Uh, in a nominating convention, it's with a whole bunch of people vote on who they think would be best to, um, to run for office in the upcoming election. Well, as elections do, this one turned particularly ugly. Both sides used mudslinging. We've talked about mudslinging before. We talked about it in the election of 1800 and, and, and in other elections. Uh, again, mudslinging, personal attacks on a political opponent. So Jackson said that Adams was like a king. And Jackson has kind of a point here when he's talking about, he's not actually talking about uh, John Quincy Adams or Jaqua uh, 
being a king necessarily. What he's talking about is rigging an election so that he can stay in power. And when the people aren't heard, uh, when they're deciding on a political leader, that sounds more like a monarchy than it does a democracy. So Jackson was accusing John Quincy Adams of uh, kind of rigging the show. Uh, Adams calls Jackson dumb. A lot of that has to do with uh, the fact that Andrew Jackson does not have a formal education like the political elite um, in Washington, D.C., and New York, and Philadelphia had. Um, this was not true about Andrew Jackson. He was he was fairly well read. He just didn't have the Ivy League education that everyone else had had. Um, <clears throat> Adams also talks about Jackson's wife, Rachel. You heard this uh, in the video. Uh, Jackson took this very, very hard. Rachel ends up um, passing away after he wins the 1820 election, but before Andrew Jackson comes to Washington, D.C. So that's where we're going to leave it for today. Your homework is to uh, read section 14.2 um, and then fill out the graphic organizer in your ISN. So there are, is a left and right hand side page in your ISN. Only do this part. Do not do the soapstone part. So just this. Soapstone stuff will be tomorrow. So your homework for tonight is going to be, uh, like I said, to read 14.2 and, and fill out the graphic organizer. So this first question asks you to write a paragraph summary of, of the section. Make sure to include these terms in your summary. Democracy, common people, vote, rich and well-born. Then you're going to be looking at the speech bubbles. So some people get confused about the speech bubbles. Uh, so the directions read, add dialogue to the speech bubbles to reflect what the common people and the upper class might have felt about Andrew Jackson's inauguration. Okay. So you're just going to write in here. Here you have this common man, and you've got an upper class guy. You might write in like, hey, I love Jackson because he loves pizza and baseball just like me okay those things are not true I'm just giving you an example uh, the upper class person might say something like I do not like a Jax because he smells bad and doesn't like America, and he hates money and me. Okay, so of course that's not true either. I'm just giving you a starting point. And then lastly, uh, this is pretty straightforward. What did Andrew Jackson promise to do uh, to promote democracy? All right, well, that's all I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed it at least got something out of it. Have a great day, and I will see you tomorrow.